Hello. So, thanks for joining me here on my YouTube channel. My name is Paul Wilkinson, and I'm with my friend Paul McKendrick. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm well, and uh, I hope you are too. I am. I'm very well indeed. We had a little chat before we did this, didn't we? A little catch up. So I thought it'd be lovely to share and talk a little bit about music. So I remember a few weeks ago, I was on Instagram and I saw I saw a picture of you, and behind it was your CD collection. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just I was thinking, gosh, that's more CDs than I've got. No, so, I don't. <laughs> so I was wondering, uh, how many do you have? Have you ever counted them? Uh, no, I haven't. I've loaded them onto my uh, good old-fashioned iPod, and I have 29,000 songs on it. My word. That's yeah. amazing. And have you been that methodical to upload every CD? Yeah. Have you? Wow. Well, and was that... It's a fine line. It's a fine line. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did it take a long time to do that? Uh, yes, it did, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I, it just shows you how sad I am. I mean, I have that time. I have. That. I did. I, I got them because my brother David McKendrick is uh, he, he's in um, media, and he did a lot of work for um, World Duty Free, and they got a contract yeah. to do a lot of airports around the world, and he also got a music contract to, to do the in-house music. But there was oh, right, okay. Yeah, so the, you had the coffee bar would play a certain type of music, um, the perfume department. We all separated these areas out and gave them different music. So classically, if you're in the wine shop and you start playing a lot of South American music, suddenly all the Argentinian and Chile wines go. However, you know, That's there okay, we are. Right. Fascinating, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Um, oh, there's, yeah, there's whole papers on it. But, uh, but oh, I, yeah, yeah. I, I bought the music for this, not the company, so it was mine. And um, and so that's how I acquired all the stuff and and genre as well. So yeah, right across the board, I've got I, I've just got stuff stuff that I love, stuff that I would never buy before and heard Brazilian right. samba music and all this stuff. And it's uh, so yeah, it um, it was a great education for me to to look at South African music or music from from Kenya and things. It just just tremendous, really. So I have a lot of fun with that. It's um. It's uh, my life, you know, in terms of music. I, there are some people who don't listen to music at all during the day. And if I don't hear music by about 10 o'clock, I'm shaking. <laughs> <laughs> How beautiful. But I know I, I feel exactly yeah. the same. It's been my uh, my single most best friend throughout my life. Mm. Uh, yeah. I think you probably agree. You know, it, uh, I listen to music all the time, intently, not so intently, but it's just always, always there all day, you know. Yeah, um, sitting down as a listening experience, and then also just having it on and listening, joining in and out on it, and um, and it's just such um, as I say, just being my best friend. So it's lovely. I, I, I get that feeling whenever I see you or we connect that you have that that set that same feeling. I think, um, um, yeah, I think I think artists do, and I think mm. when you look at artists, that people do that um, that they um, they need they need creation around them i mean some have kids you know the ultimate creation but uh, so as a species we're really interested in it um and and so that can be um it, it can be shown through different ways you know ford will make a car and say criminals it will take them five minutes to get to this and a criminal will say i think i can do that in a minute well that's that's creativity <laughs> but uh, antisocial but you know we're, we're <laughs> creating all the time and so yeah, some uh, musicians get an opportunity to do it, sculptors get an opportunity to do it, photographers. We get this opportunity to start with a blank canvas and make something, and that's, wow. Yeah, absolutely. For me, like, I always go on about it, like, imagination is the only really truth-bearing factor, uh, and that's so important for me, and I think it's prevalent in everything in society, you know, the imagination, everything we see is a, a plug socket or a light bulb or a shelf is, has been created by somebody's imagination, hasn't it? Yeah, and and other we, animals too. No, we don't know about that. You know, a dolphin might do a, ba a backflip, and all the other dolphins do a backflip. You know, so they're, they're creating art. We just don't know it. But um, but yeah, everything seems to be creating something. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. So, do you have an artist that that wins hands down for the? What is the? Have you got a single most artist that you've got the most CDs of? Is the one that I'm I'm look I'm looking at mine. I can see a couple that come to mind. But do you have an artist that you love so much that you've got everything of theirs? Um, 
I've got a lot of Jimi Hendrix, I've got a lot of Jeff Beck, I've got a lot of Miles Davis. Some of those artists, it's not, it's not what they played in certain cases. Um, they're not the, the, the ultimate in their game. Um, Miles Davis, you know, there, there were better technical players than him, definitely. Of course, yeah, no, I, I would agree, and I would, I would I'd jump in it and say I'm, that would be on my list of the most collection I have as well. Would be Miles Davis, yeah. The idea of him, it's the concept of him, it's the Jimi Hendrix of him. Um, it, it turns out it's the people when you look at who's passed through through that That's house. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, he had a way, didn't he, of sort of bringing people in, yeah, and then yeah. getting like the that, best out of those people himself with with people who he knew could could make him better, you know, or or um teach him something uh, and so miles davis although there's a lot of stories about you know him saying to john cochran play what you don't know there were the sides of it where he was looking at john cochran saying wow i just learned something there but he, he uh, you know probably don't people people don't realize that he was um he was um a learner you know he was absolute i mean i mean the story goes i don't know if you know but like when when they had the second second great sort of uh Quartet, sorry, quintet with Matt, with Herbie and uh, you know Wayne Shorter. Apparently, on the first night, you know he he, he didn't know where beat one was. You know, because Herbie and <laughs> Herbie and Ron were just uh, Herbie and the drummer were just playing around with time, and he didn't have a clue. But he kept coming back for more because he wanted to just absorb this, these yeah. amazing young musicians. You know, Tony Williams on drums. God knows how old he was. He was only young, wasn't he? Uh, Paul, he wasn't so old, was he? So, and I just find it really fascinating. And he was always trying to evolve, wasn't he? Yeah, uh, and the other side of it for me is technology. Um, you know, um, mm -hmm. the domino effect of um, Jim Marshall and a Wawa pedal. Suddenly, mm -hmm. that's given to Hendrix, and it, it, you know, he, he does something remarkable with it. But if there wasn't those things in place, he might have done something else. You know, he might have done some wonderful noises with a Vox amp or a Fender amp. But it was just these combinations that, um, that by luck, serendipity, whatever. He he's able to grab these tools, put them in his toolbox, and and just do that. You know, it's fantastic. I know, absolutely. I mean, I don't, the story goes, doesn't it, that Miles Davis was watching Hendrix and just swore all the way through the gig, doesn't he? We just um, he just couldn't believe what he was seeing. <laughs> None of them, I don't know, but... Beck or anyone, they just all saw him and clapped and said, "Well, that's it. I've finished. I'm not going to bother him." <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? That, and of course, he was always evolving, wasn't he? I, I mean, I know you're familiar with the music of Keith Jarrett, you know, and Keith hated electric pianos. I don't know if you know this, but. Yeah, he just wished he could have played piano, of course, but he couldn't, you know. But he just wanted to play, like, like you've just hinted at, he just wanted to be around Miles, didn't he? Yeah, um, Keith um, Jarrett, he, it took me a, a long time to, to get into him. It was, of course, the noises that he's, the singing noises he made live. Right, okay. So what was the first win for you with Keith, uh, Paul? What did you listen to first? Um, standards. And it was standards. 1970s. Ooh, ooh, might be 1982, 83. 80, was it the 82, 82, was it Standards Volume 1 and 2? Yeah, yeah, the live mm. stuff. And then I went yeah, back. Yeah. But of course, I, I mean, I, I started off as a guitarist, 14-year-old. My mum bought me a, a Zenta for, for 15 quid. Um, and um, as, And so I was interested in... Uh, uh, people like Blackmore, and right, then I read yeah, yeah. A, yeah, an interview with uh, Santana and thought, well, he sounds interesting, and I bought Santana, and mm. then uh, Marvish and Orchestra came out, and, and, ah, right, okay. read his, and of course that leads you back to Miles, and one, once you go there, that's it, that's, so it's Herbie Hancock, so it's Joe Zawano and Weather Report, and just that, that whole astonishing. So I, I got um, Chikoria, uh, and um, um uh, all of them from from miles really so yeah so, so keith jarrett his cone concert was sensational i i heard that when i was babysitting that i used to take my slade records around to babysit for this guy and right okay he would, he would leave out albums for me to listen to to tempt me so i I bring my made in japan by deep purple and slade's come on fill the noise with and then yeah, he yeah, leave right. me like um Nucleus and Eleventh uh, House. Right. And okay. Right. Well, yeah. And then I well, play it and go, "There's no, there's no guitars on this." But uh, and bitches brew. <laughs> he let me, he bitches brew. And so, so right, it was well. him. Really. You know, it was him who, who kind of said, "Try this," and, uh, and that was that was it. I was I was gone. Yeah. 
But he must have known you had an open mind. You must have known you had an open mind, Paul. Oh, yeah. For that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you knew. Um, a similar, you? Said, yeah, similar story to me, I suppose. It came through Sting for me, Paul, really. Did you? Wow. Yeah, which I'm sure these albums oh, you know, you know, like, like Bring on the Night, Dream of the yeah. Blue Turtles, yeah, you know, Nothing Like the Sun. Idol. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I hearing Kenny. Amazing. Astonishing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, astonishing. And Kenny Kirkland was a piano player, and I was just blown away with that. I, you know, I never heard anything like it. And then before I knew it, it took me to Winter Mouth Ellis, and then that took me to Herbie Hancock, and then that took me to Mount Davis, like you said. <laughs> yeah. And I just thought those albums were astonishing, you know, and, and just like you said a, a while ago, Sting's always surrounded himself with musicians that are far better than him. Yeah. And he's good himself, you know, but he's just surrounded some of these phenomenal musicians who can take his music and just make it sound amazing, you know. Yeah, and he adapted, you know, when he was that last exit band or whatever in Newcastle, and he gets down to London Absolutely, and joins yeah. the band. But, to, but yeah. returns to his roots in a way. In, in fact, more than that, you know, some some of his albums are all about um, Newcastle and the, and the 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 shipyards and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. A great yeah, adapter. So Absolutely, yeah. So for me, it was a, that was a way in really there, trying to understand that language. You know, like like we said, bring on the night that long Kenny Kirkland piano solo. I was just astonished. But I'd never heard this musicianship before, sort of coming up yeah. as a keyboard player, listening to Elton John and Billy Joel and, you know, and, 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 and squeeze and all. Players, Absolutely. But then just to hear a different kind of language that I was like, oh, my gosh, what's this? Yeah. They can do it, I think. I think, um, I think when you hear uh, um, those players noodling, they, they all have a finger in jazz. Some of their arrangements are um, mm. jazz-based in a way. They've, you know, they, they know the rules of pop and they follow that because that's where the money is. But um, but within their recordings, you know, Captain Fantastic the Durban oh. Cover, whatever. Yeah, yeah, stuff, yeah, absolutely. A lot of where you go, oh, that's interesting. It's gone there. You know, um, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You hear Elton, yeah, like Elton John album, whatever. You just hear his feel, you know, like country comfort songs that don't get much of an airing, I suppose, these, these days. But it just feels great, doesn't it? Yeah. Just... Yeah, that's probably the link. For people to say to me, what kind of music do you like? Well, no. <laughs> I was once, <laughs> I, was, I was probably about, I was probably about 45, 50. And a mate of mine, his, his 14 year old kid came in the room and said, What's your favourite band? And I said, well, do you mean jazz, reggae? And he went, oh, for goodness sake, and walked out. And I thought that was beautiful because mm. I knew, I knew Deep Purple were the greatest band ever when I was 14, a full stop, no questions, you know. So it was lovely to see him uh, being so upset that I was dithering. You know, he knew he was right. And well, I questions are more important than answers, aren't they? So that's a deep question. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. And, 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 and uh, you yeah. No, no, just you know, it's just, uh, and so then, did you to, to ask you a little bit more? Did you then? So you ended up forming a band, didn't you? Later on, or, I'm sure you had a few bands, but you formed a band with a friend that I know, Andy Thornton. And can you tell us a bit about that, Paul? I'd be interested to well, know more about that's it. Before that, because um, we had a guitar right, uh, lying around the house, and we all used to pick it up. So that's my brother John, my brother Martin, and my brother right, David. Okay. And uh, John kind of disappeared for a while, but. Um, but Martin, he, he learned to play drums through a, through a correspondence course. Right, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and Dave picked up a bass. He's a good guitar player as well. And I play guitar. And we used to go to my uncle's farm, way out in the sticks near, near Malton, and just um, make a hell of a noise. But that was our grounding. That was our foundation. And then, so I formed a band with a, with a, a neighbour, Leon Phillips, who later became a sound guy and played with Red Lorry, Yellow Lorry, and he was front of house for, for Jethro at all. But for, for me, he was this this kid who just could play guitar and he had a Gibson energy, beautiful. Um, so that was that was the motivators, yeah. really. And right, then that, okay. morphed into, that morphed into Secret People with Paul Siddall. I met him, my keyboard player, in, in 1982. And then right, Secret okay. People moved into the Psyche, which is where I met Steve Grisanto and who's a great producer now, and Andy yeah, Thornton. Course, yeah. So I've been playing with Paul Siddall since 1982. I've been playing with Colin the drum since 1989, Andy Thornton right. since 19. They go way back, you know. We just Dude, go, don't you? Wow. Yeah, it is, and it, it, it's great that it's a what a great hobby to hang out with your mates and play music. Absolutely, 
And then, so did that last quite a while? Were you together quite a bit? Um, uh, Psyche was 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 Geisy Brothers with him, uh, uh, um, Steve, yeah. and then uh, Steve, and then around nineteen ninety eight, ninety nine, he started getting into into producing. Um, but yeah, the Geisy Brothers we um, we formed. It was my brother David's idea, actually. He said, "Well, we walk into a pub and you see all these Marshall stacks, and you think, oh no, why can't we just go to a, a venue?" See, hear acoustic music, hear the words, hear, hear the songs, hear the melodies, because we're all getting old. And so we said, oh, why don't we do it? We'll, we'll form a band and do it. So that's what the Geyser Brothers does. It plays everything from 1962 Ray Charles right the way through to Prince or whatever. I think we, our cutoff is about 1989 and just play <laughs> acoustic versions of classic music, whether it be Elton John or Fleetwood Mac or, or more yeah, obscure yeah. stuff. And uh, and people seem to like it. They all go, oh, it's so nice to hear the words. So yeah, that's that's the raison d'être of, of the guys about this. Yeah. Oh, not no one else. No one's geeky. No, of course, absolutely not. Of course, and I'm, I'm sure you're uh, you'll be eager to get back together after this uh, period of uh, being uh, in isolation. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, same for you. Although you're a solo artist, it's there's nothing quite like playing live in front of an audience and, and then you get what I call the circle of joy. They love it. They <laughs> give you yeah. they give you this feeling of wanting to do better and then you pass it down the line and they get it and it just it starts to escalate and it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. That's live is yeah. great. So I think you miss that too, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. You get the shiny eyes, don't you? You look out and you've got them, you know, the 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 they're at one with the music and particularly yeah. being an improviser, because I don't know where it's going. They don't know where it's going as well. So there's kind of a two-way yeah. thing going on, which I think is, is just really special about about playing live. And, uh, you know, people listening to this now, I encourage people after this, if they haven't, to get out and, and see sublime music, you know. I'm sure you'll certainly say when that. Certainly when improvised. I, I mean, I knew Keith Jarrett did, and his, his Jap uh, Japanese concert that he later did he, is his favourite. But when I came to see you, um, hmm. and I think, this one was Halifax. It was uh, the Halifax. That's, that's when we first met. Yeah, that's right. I remember Andy did the Andy yeah, exactly. did the sound for us. And um, and you said, okay, I don't know what I'm going to play. I'm going to sit down and start playing. And with my solo stuff, my little half hour um, slots that I do, I don't know what I'm going to play. I took that from you and thought, you know what? Although I I I, I know about sixty songs or, or maybe hundred mm -hmm. songs, but but it's when I sit down and start to play, that's when I think, okay, I'm going to play this. And then I'll morph it. I don't speak. I just morph it into another song, into another song. That, you know, so I'll end up on a, right. a scene seventh or something and go, oh, I know, that sounds like um, that sounds like Marvin Gaye. What's going on? I'll do that. So you taught me to just um, just go with it. What's the worst thing? I'm not playing Wembley, you know, so... Just Absolutely, fun. yeah. I mean, I like what, what what somebody once said to Wayne Short. What 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 is jazz? And he said, "Jazz is I dare you." <laughs> 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 and that sounds like uh, I dare you there, Paul. What you're doing, and it's lovely you sharing these songs. And I think you're making it. You're giving um from your place. You're giving a feeling out to everybody else who are really enjoying it, aren't they? By the look of it, they are, and um and that's really sweet, and um. It, it, it is. I, I, I cottoned on fairly quickly. I, um, two things. My, um, my band, Secret People, we supported uh, Lionel Richie at the NEC. That's, that's 11,000 people a night. We, um, wow. Right. Okay. Yeah. And we, the first night we did our show and then we watched Lionel Richie. And um, about the sixth song in, um, a girl in a wheelchair came up and gave me some flowers to the front. He said, thank you so much. And then throughout the show, like the guitarist would run over to the bass player and whisper something into his ear. The bass player would laugh. And you thought, wow, this, this is a real show. And blow me if they didn't do exactly the same the next night and exactly the same the next night. And you thought, oh, this is a show. This is broad. Oh, right. Right, okay. But, um, I, I, and I, I got it because if you have a bad night, as long as you hit your spot, as long as you run over to the guitarist and make him smile, doesn't matter how, how if you've got a hangover or you slept badly or you're just playing badly, as long as you do that, people uh, are entertained. 
but they, and they, they don't see, you know, we talk about the swan floating on the water, they don't see the legs working <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh, it's a show. So I, I've incorporated the two, really. One is, the show is the show, and that's, that's the pro thing of it. And two is, it's not about me. Because when I used to go see bands, I would go see Argent or, or Joe Jackson or whatever, and I mm. and I love those artists, but I, but part of it was also I hope that girl's there that night, and she was she was at the XTC gig. Oh, she probably likes Joe Jackson as well. She might be there. I had mm. my own agenda. I had my own agenda for going, and mm. now when I do a gig, I know some have come to see us, but some haven't another agenda, and I'm the sound chat track to their agenda. Mm. And that's that's, the- that's brilliant. Isn't yeah, it? Ab- just... ab- yeah ab- absolutely it is. And then they're coming for that, aren't they? Like, I think that's a really beautiful way of uh, of looking at it. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's really nice. Whatever. Yeah. And um, and so that they might remember that. They, they might go, oh, yeah, that's where I met my wife. And I was the soundtrack yeah. to that. So yeah, yeah. I, that's, it, 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 it really isn't about me. I don't, it, it's not look at me, look at me, look at me. It's um, look at yourselves. You know, just listen. And, and that's, again, wow, when you play live, that's never going to happen again. Those people in that venue, that's never going to happen again. No, you there's an alignment to... there, isn't there, which is kind of, you, I, can't, I can't say why one night's better than another when I'm improvising. You know, the, the audience leave happy, like you say, but for me, there's sometimes one night where everything goes right, you know, and you can't, you can't explain what, what that is. Everything lines up and everything just yeah. works from beginning to end. And that was another nice way. You... He says he chases that. Who, who says that? Pat Matheny. He yeah. says they'll be this night and then you're always chasing that to make that happen again because it's so, it's so incredible. And that's why he keeps playing because any minute, you know, tonight might be the night when it all clicks yeah. again. Yeah. And of course, you know, I don't know if you know, but he, he um, he re- you know, he's in, he's in before, like the sound check is already, he's first in the gig at night, you know, practicing in the afternoon and, yeah. you know, he, he, he's so intense the way he plays and he, Chris Potter, the American saxophone player, you know, who played in his band a few years ago, said, you know, you're always, I'd get there to practice early and Pat would always be there before me. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I got into Pat Matheny, um. Yeah, let's talk about t- Pat. Yeah, sure. and I think it was 1981, 82, and, and it was on late night TV, and I thought, what the heck is this? Who, what's going on in here? With, uh, with Lyle Mays, of course, and um, I think there was Andy Gottlieb on drums at the time, maybe not. Yeah. And uh, uh, Robbie on guitar, who is the bass player, who produces a lot of the stuff. Uh, Steve anyway. Rodby, yeah, Steve Rodby on bass, yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, it was just astonishing, and I went out straight away and bought Travels and um, live double album, so that's how oh, I got God, it. And, yeah, that's the starting point for me. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful piece, isn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely stunning. Yeah, for me, what was it? What did I really get into? I suppose, obviously, uh, oof, I, I, I did like the Electric Group, so there's still Life Talking, which I really yeah. loved. Yeah, uh, and then that traced me back to the you know the great trio in yeah, with Jeff Cole. Well, on oh, ECM yeah. records. Well, yeah. and, and I don't know. Mitchell. Oh, yeah, The Shadows and Light. Yeah. 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 Astonishingly well. beautiful, isn't it, that? Yeah. So I've, always, that's I've always been... Come on, Paul. Carry on. No, you first. <laughs> All right. I, um, yeah, that's how I got his name. And then, of course, he brought his mate, Lyle Mayers, to play with him. With with because I knew uh, Jack of Astoria, of course, and I know Rob was a massive fan of Johnny Mitchell. Um, that's how I got into Mitchell. Robin Ford because he played on Miles of Isles, and you think it was Robin Ford. Ah, Ford's right, okay. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, pass it. yeah. Well, I love all that stuff, you know, that Pat's done, and he's always trying to trying to do um, new things, isn't he? Some of those solo guitar albums are really sweet as well; they're really beautiful, aren't they? I love the thing, yeah. I don't know if you heard, the thing you did with Brad Meldown, that was really interesting that they did together. Yes, it was. They did, they did two albums, didn't they, I think? One with yeah, the band did... and yeah, quartet and yeah. something else. Yeah. Which I thought, that, that was just great that they were doing that. I, I don't know if you know the story, but apparently Pat was driving in the car and he heard um, an album by Joshua Redman called Mood Swing and Brad started having a solo and he just had to pull over because he just couldn't believe what he was hearing, you know. <laughs> I saw Brad Meldown. <laughs> In uh, in Amsterdam, um, 
uh, mate of mine, Themis, a guitarist, Greek uh, guy, he said he's well. I, I know, I know Themis. But I haven't seen him for years. I know him through oh. friend of a friend. I didn't know Themis that well, but I, I knew of him, and we did talk now and again. Yeah, right. Go on, carry oh, on. So you saw Brad. Yeah, yeah. Yes. He was at the college. Very fine guitar yeah. player himself. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, and um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I saw him there. I, I, uh, I'm trying to think of the venue, but. Uh, but yeah, it was it was knockout. It was absolutely brilliant. And so I followed him since then. And Themis was always putting stuff my way, you know, like right, Joshua okay. and, uh, um, and Bram and Dow. And why not did he give me that time? Oh, my word. Oh, uh, Michael Pilch of Pilk, P-I-L-C. Right, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Player, right, uh, that's it. Uh, yeah. Hard, Amazing. tough stuff, hard bop stuff. Really, ouch. Yeah, yeah. So, just, uh, so like, just going back a bit now. So, what did you think when you were doing your babysitting over and you you listened to Bitches Brew then for the first time? Uh, I I didn't know what was going on. I knew. Me I too. Liked, <laughs> yeah, uh, and I still I still listen to it and go, oh, I don't get that. But once you understand that it's cut up, that it's copy and paste, absolutely. Um, and you go, aha. And again, first, uh, um, a producer, Tony Maceo, who's, who's the guy? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it was Maceo. Yeah, his yeah. Idea to, to say, well, we'll have a little bit of that and have a little bit of that. And so you can hear you can hear the tempos um, speed up a little and you think, and that's simply because it's, it, it's, uh, it's cut and paste, but using the, the studio as a tool. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I listened to it a few weeks ago and I heard it for a while and I, I absolutely loved it. You know, I really enjoyed mm. it. I, I don't yeah. know if you know the story goes like Herbie and so there was John McLaughlin and Herbie done the session and I think I don't know which one of them said it to each other but they went out of the studio and one of them said was that any good and the other one said oh welcome to a Miles Davis session you know <laughs> yeah Billy Cobham said I don't know what happened there um, was he recording <laughs> oh yeah you'll hear that in about three years time <laughs> <laughs> and he did yeah. <laughs> I I um I I don't know if you know the Miles album Nefertiti. I don't know if you know that. One. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. But I was I was I was hearing Herbie and Wade Short talking a while ago, and and somebody said to me, "Has there ever been a track that you recorded that got away?" And Herbie, you know, he's quite sort of Buddhist anyway. So, well, nothing's gone away. It's gone out in the ether of the sound that we've made. But he said to Wayne, he says, "Do you remember that version of Nefertiti we did?" And he says, oh, Wayne went, "Oh yes, I do." He said, "Cause they finished playing it," and and, and the Miles said, "Did uh, did you record that?" And the stupid engineer went, uh, no. And like Miles went, when I lift my horn, you press that button. When I lift my horn, you press that button. I thought it because I love that album as well. You know, all that period. I love that group. Yeah. Yes, the man with the horn as well. Later, of course, um, yeah, when he had that five years sabbatical and came back and 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 made pop pop records really. Um, yeah, what two but, two wasn't it with Marcus Miller? Yeah, uh, Amandla. I think it was the one after. Amanda, and, yeah, of course. Forget about that one. And he did a rap album. He did, didn't he? Yeah, he did a rap album. And then, um, yeah, all, ar all around that period. I mean, uh, he was just, he, every five years, he kind of, uh, he, he, he just, he went forward, didn't he? You know, he didn't look back. That's what yeah. I admire about him. I try and be like that. What do you think about right. Bora? I don't know that one. Is that a Miles album, a late one, is it? Yeah, he's a Dutch guy, and he gave him colours, orange and blue and stuff like that. I'll have to he... check that one out. I don't know that one at all. Yeah, very what do you think of it? Um, I, I love it. I, I, I love all his stuff. I, I love the mistakes. Um, I love the, the noise, you know, that, uh, um, yeah. Um, John McLaughlin's playing on some of those is really is bad. Wrong? It's really bad, it? <laughs> but um, and how to tune um, because right. they didn't have tuners, you know. <laughs> tuning now, you just stick on the edge of your guitar head, you stock, and and then there you are. But um, yeah, some of it's some of it's just well dodgy. The live albums that he made in seventy one, seventy two, Pango, uh, not Pango, I said, um, there's two of them that he made in Japan. One was the day recording, one was the night recording. With, oh, um, yes, I know which ones you mean. A while, while guitar, three guitars at some point, all trying to sound like Hendrix. What a what a <laughs> coffin that is. Um, but you, you wade through that to listen to uh, Mike Henderson on bass and um, the drummer. Yeah. And, the master, and you think, oh, wow, that's, that's great. I think, I think that's a... Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. 
I mean, I yeah, love that right. period. I, I love that period where he, I don't know if you know this album. Uh, let me get the title right. I think it's like Live Evil. I don't know if you know that yes. one. Yeah, there was all yeah, that was, stuff. Black Beauty. Yeah, black, yeah, yeah, all that period. I mean, it's really interesting because, like you say, I think sometimes you have to listen to music for a while and you go through that thing that's not really happening and then you just present it with something absolutely stunningly beautiful, aren't you? Mm, yeah. And you're like, whoa, uh, that was worth that four minutes to just hear that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. <laughs> um, I, have, I find that with Paul Blair. I don't know if you know Paul Blair. Uh, yes, Carla's chap. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's same with Paul when he improvises. You know, three or four minutes, you're like, oh, my gosh. And then you get something, you're just like, oh, that will worth the wait because it's just absolutely astonishingly beautiful, you know. Yeah, take it's a really risk. lovely. Yeah. What's that's the worst it, that could happen? I'm not a yeah, brain surgeon. What's the worst that could happen, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's that, it's just that, that discovery, really, isn't it? So other, other jazz guitarists you like, Paul, then? So John Schofield, do you like John as well? I love don't... him. Love him. Is, love him. Uh, um, so there's a, yeah, there's there's a, um, a sound that guitars a guitarist chase, and it's called chewy. It's just got a little bit of bite on it, and it's um, yeah, it, it, right, okay. Someone's chew, you can you can hear the sound in the word, and uh, and he is beautifully chewy. Um, he's tuneful. He um, he just knows where he is, you know, on the on the keyboard. I uh, I think for me, the musicians, I, I'm all right. I, I'm I'm a, an okay player. It's the ones who do stuff I can't do. It's a bit like um, lyric writers, because I know yeah. the the toolbox. I know the tricks of the trade. When someone does that, I kind of go, "Oh yeah, I've seen what's in there." There's, there's an inter rhyme, and yeah, it's quite clever. But it's the ones who do the stuff I can't do that I go, "Oh, how did you? How did you do that? What were what were you reading? What are you inputting?" To make you output, and so there are some guitarists who, who um, are just, they just like Jeff Beck, you know, who can who can do all the jazz stuff mm. uh, that would blow by blow. But um, so uh, Kurt Rosenwinkel and um, oh, well, like so my many. friend was once my, my friend was once in New York and he was at the Vanguard and R Rosenwinkel was playing and Clapton was in the front row. <laughs> yeah, oh wow, okay, says it yeah. all, doesn't it? You know, yeah, Rosenwinkel. I think I'll stop now. <laughs> He's thinking, well, I think he ended up, I did tour with him a bit a few years ago, did Rosa Winkle playing some, you know, playing on stage with him a bit. I mean, yeah, he must have just been like, that's astonishing playing. You know? I wonder just if he's it. ever invited him to the, the uh, Crossroads Guitar Festival. Oh, I, do you know what, but I think he has, actually. I'm I not certain, but I think he must have done, yeah. Again, just, just uh, because that's a big fact, and he just says, you know, listen to these, have a listen to this, see what's going on here. I like them, do you like them? That's the great facilitator. Yeah. Absolutely, and of course, it, you, you don't realise that these people have a love in this other music that a lot of people that follow Clapton don't realise how much he loves all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And how much he embraces it, you know. Yeah, no, it's, um, I mean, he's a great player. Have you, heard, have you heard much of Adam Rogers? Is he a name familiar to you at all? Or? Yeah, yeah, Themis would yeah. ask me, ask me all would that stuff. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Wayne Krantz, I love. Just Amazing, geez. of course, absolutely. Yeah, Wayne Krantz, amazing. And then I'll go the other way with uh, people like uh, Matthias Eklund, Swedish guy. Right, um, okay, yeah, yeah. Full on um, Steve Ijo Satriani, but with humour. Yeah. So he'll, he'll do an acoustic uh, gypsy jazz version of a Kiss song. He'll do yeah, right. smoke on the water, but, but technically, technically mind-blowing. Just unbelievable. Um, uh, Jan Ackerman, stunning. Yeah, oh, Oh, stunning player, stunning. absolutely stunning. Yeah. yeah. And he did all that, that kind of funk and, and Sylvia and Hocus Pocus as a joke. You can see him smiling. But as a loop, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As a loop player, wow. Just yeah, wow. Yeah. And a lot of guitarists revered him because they knew, all the technical cats knew what he was doing and how easy he made it look. And he's still playing. Now he's gone into a kind of smooth jazz. It's really nice because he's 17. This is music. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, yeah, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'm just trying to. Grant Green and uh, uh, George Benson and um, Charlie Christensen, of course. Um, oh, just, just loads. So, well, but, I mean, Benson's an amazing player, isn't it? The pop root kind of is what he's well known for, but, you know, there is some early stuff with him and Keith Jarrett together, actually. Yeah, that CTI yeah. record. Yeah, stuff. yeah. 
and all the all the hidden musicians behind him who who were uh, i mean that's part of my my connection show is just talking about all these guys who are around and has existed for years who you never hear you never heard that they're not on the tip of your tongue whether it be the wrecking crew uh, carol k or or, or glenn campbell yeah. Uh, and all of this, you know, there's this whole body army of musicians that have played on thousands and thousands of tracks, and you just don't know. Yeah, and the most of the public, you wouldn't, you know, if you said Steve Gabb, they wouldn't realize how many records no. they've heard with him playing the drums, you know. No. The other so, side of that is, is where, you know, you'd say to someone, why, why do you like this? Is it, you know, is it, is it the bass line? Is it, no, I just like it. Yeah, yeah. They, they can't break it down. We're the worst. We're shocking. When someone plays to me and says, what do you think about this? And I go, there's a bit too much reverb on the snare. <laughs> Goodness sake. You know, and people just, they don't hear that. So it's the same in terms of, okay, so people haven't heard of um, uh, um, Paul Bookmaster or whatever, you know. To, to yeah, them. yeah, great arrangement. Yeah, yeah. Do I like this? Yes. Do I like do I like Absolutely. This? Yeah. And there we are. But at bottom of, you know, end of, we do, we we have no, um, go, we we can't we can't comprehend uh, music in, in in a way now because we're because we're so close to it and we know how it's done. That we're uh, an example of that is my my um my cousin. Uh, he's a he's an engineer, and I, mm. he said I'll have a cup. I made him I made him a cup of tea in a metal cup, and he said wow. Could the spot welding on that and i said well <laughs> i just bought it because i liked it so and that's the same you know we're going wow look at the spot welding on that and people are going oh shut up it's just a nice song yeah we're too no, close we're, we are yeah it once happened to my old piano to my great friend bill who's still in his in his 80s now he's still alive he went to he went to betty's tea room and he, he said he, he said i had a bit of a cold you know and there was some somebody was playing the piano and he said and for a moment i lost sort of the tonal center and i uh, just for a moment, you know, while I sort of cleared my nose, I, I felt like a member of the public, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I lost, I lost where things were, and it was like it was a quite a horrific moment. And suddenly, I was, I was back in the room. Oh, there's the dominant or whatever, and, you know. Yeah. And I, yeah. just made me chuckle. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. But what, so what you about you? Do... Go on. What, what about you listening to? An album you made ten ten years ago, for instance, or or, or you know the, the the stuff you've got on audio of you playing six seven years ago. Are you able to listen to that with distance now? Or are you still there in the room going, "Oh yeah, I remember that was a second take." What what do you? What right, do you think yeah, about no, it? no, I think I think I am able to listen to it with distance, if if not be uncomfortable by by some of you know by some of it, but still very fond of it. But yeah, no, I think actually quite quickly I forget what chord, chord movements I may have made. Um, mm. And I did that actually with that album that, that Andy helped me, uh, well, Andy's helped me to record a, a number of them, but the one that are called Choice, which I think you know. I left it about six months before I listened to it, which meant I was so far removed from it, I couldn't remember, because we left that session with about four and a half hours of piano music, so. Okay. So, yes, we that's do, the only do. way in the end, really, isn't it, to to leave it and approach it with fresh ears and, yeah. Yeah, and it was like none other, no other album I'd ever made before, but basically where we sort of over-recorded, you know. Um, and, and I think that worked really well, actually, just to like, I've never done that before. Normally I get what I feel is the right length and then go with that, but we just kept going, you know. We had, we had a 10 hours in the studio, but there was a lot of tea drinking, as usual, you know, biscuit eating. And, uh, <laughs> and we just kept recording, you know, and Andy kept saying, just have another go, and you know. And then we, because we were cutting it to vinyl, he could sort of knock on the window when we got to like 17 minutes, you know, like put his hands over his neck to say, right, yeah, come on now, bring an end to it, which was good in a way because it stopped me dawdling as well. Because he was like, you know, we can't go any more than maybe 18, 19 minutes a side record. We're going to lose quality. You know, yeah. like Andy knows all, you know, Andy knows all that stuff. So that was, that made me play differently. Sometimes it would bring an end to a piece in a quite a nice way, you know. Yeah. And, and it's a, 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 um, a trusting uh, under the soul, it's, it's delegating your ears and your stuff to another person and trusting them to 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 do the right job where you forget about them, you forget that they're in the room. Um, so that's that's um, that's some people find that difficult to do. Um, 
But that mm. changes uh, 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 choices. Sorry, I still listen to that, and I really uh, uh, I love it. And there's also times when I hear stuff, and I go, I don't remember that bit. Oh, that's nice. have... Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful, a beautiful album, and um, some of it's again quite challenging. So you think, you know, you forget, and you think, oh, I'll put choices on because it's. Um, you know, it's it's quiet, it's relaxing, and I'll listen to that. And um, and some of it isn't. And you think, oh, oh, right, okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I want to no, tell you to nice, a you, you really like this. It's some of, some of it's really soothing. This this third track, listen to this, and then the, halfway through it, this kind of all these um these dense chords start happening, and they kind of shuffle and go, okay, doesn't he sing? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're... Yeah, brilliant. Well, I mean, on that, I think that third track's probably going to, you know, be in my handful of improvs I'm really sort of attached to, really. that sort of broods for about 12 minutes. And, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's not in a rush to move to a different sound world, if you see what I mean. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I really I, enjoyed that. You play it. Of course, I saw you play it at um, Colin, the, the drummer from Guys of Us. He, he had you in to do, uh, to do a nice oh, well, session. Oh, lovely evening. Mm. Yeah, and uh, the, the living room concerts. I think you did one with. I did, uh, yeah. Philip made an album of. I did, uh, I which did, is, yeah. Do you do both sides now by Jenny Mitchell? I do. I do. I love that song. Yeah. Yeah, it is tremendous. Yeah, yeah. But that, yeah, tremendous. that was that was that was uh, a that was a lovely evening. That uh, the, at Colin's house, and again, you were the soundtrack to make that a lovely evening. It, it yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful evening. I couldn't have wished for a. It was just so much of a lovely evening. Yeah, oh, it was lovely, yeah. and we had, so we had kind of. I seem to remember quite a lot of Radiohead fans, so there was a lot of that coming out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah Actually, cool. I played a. Tu- I remember playing a tune that you recorded the other day, the uh, John Mayer tune, "Stop This Pain," which I think is a fabulous piece of music. What made you oh, pick that? I did Gravity. Yeah, ah, you did Gravity, yeah, not Stop This Train, sorry, yeah, Gravity, but Stop This Train's another, Gravity's great as well, Stop This Train's, uh, I just think it's a harmonic, it's such a clever song. He, uh, he's Marmite, isn't he, there are some who just dislike him intensely, I think it's um, because of his baggage or, or that he did have, you know, whether it be Jenna Branston or, or him being a big rock and roll star, and then, and then they're also jealous of him, the um, Stevie Ray Vaughan's Guitar Tech came out of retirement to work with John Mayer because he right, was that okay, good. Yeah. And Eric Clapton said, John Mayer doesn't know how good he is. So, yeah, yeah. so I approach it from a guitar point of view, but lyrically, lyrically, he's so good. Sometimes he can be really plain, um, mm. which is a hard to do, to be really simple. And then he'll do um, uh, something like Assassin, I'm an Assassin too. Um, uh, I'm just clerical, uh, clever lyrical ideas. There's one song he did about, I think he did Dolly Parton or someone, Queen of, Queen of uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 I think it is that one, yeah. 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 Uh, every, every song has got something in it, like David Bowie, every song has got something in it where you go, oh, where did you get that idea? That's so cool. Yeah, yeah, but such I a great really feel like as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like it. But, uh, yeah, but a lot no, of I, no I do as well. Yeah. But lyrics, melody, you know, I'm a cool. good melodies, yeah. Great melodies, great groove, Pino Palladino on bass, grooving it up in here. They sound great, don't yeah. they, you know? Oh, the trio bit, yeah, that was cool. Yeah. And then a lot of people got upset because he was playing Hendrix, and you think, oh, calm down. The guy's just having fun, you know? Absolutely, and that's what we do. We play, we don't, we, you know, you play the guitar, you don't work the guitar. <laughs> well, some people, some people say, oh, yeah, <laughs> ham fisted. I do. I know I can get away with that. I'm shocking, really. The guys are brothers, they, they've always allowed me to play. They go, okay, Paul, but we'll just keep you in the mix. It's your voice, <laughs> if you like. But just, um, yeah. Um, my brother David is a great player. Um, and, you know, he took it all the finger picking and chat acting stuff as well. He's really good at that. So, um, when, <laughs> when Dave and I go together to a, to a party or something, you always give Dave the guitar and say, sing us a song, Dave. Because he'll do he'll do all the stuff you know uh, that's easy on the ear that's well played, and uh, and then I'll come out with the uh, sign of the times by Prince. And people go, what? I saw this. We can't sing along with that. Or or if I do play something that people know, I'll, I'm like you. I'll add a little bit. I'll change it. You know, like Frank Sinatra. He wasn't a songwriter, 
he, he was just given these songs and that's his interpretation of the song so much Absolutely. so that he wrote it you know that's the great the great songers the singists that's what they do so when when i look at a track um like gravity or something i'll i'll approach it as if i've never heard or or I'll base my thing on 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 Mayer, but I I'll say okay, well this is if it was given to me as a new song with this melody line and, and these words, this is how this is how what I do with it. You know, "Cheat to Cheat" by Ella Fitzgerald is completely different to the way Frank Sinatra does it. It's a different way to Billie Holiday does it. You know, so. The covers and stuff, right. so, and and you do that. You know, when you play both sides now, that's you saying this is what I feel. Absolutely, and it's like, yeah, here's, it, it's a, a rough canvas, and we can see what we can paint each night that might be different. You know, I think that's because if a great song like that, you can do all sorts with it. You know, I think that's what's magical about something like that. Yeah, and that's why Radiohead, the, the, the jazzers love them. They just love yeah. them because of what they do chordally. How many songs do you think you know? Ooh, that's a good. I've been asked that before. I've never really counted them. Mm. I suppose it must be in the hundreds. I would say. Yeah, but I've never really counted them. I can always kind of, I bet like you, Paul, I can kind of fluff through something if I don't really know it. You know, well, harmonically, you know, I can get away with it. Yeah, uh, you know, I consider you as a musician. I, um, Brian Eno says he's a non-musician, um, and, and so I'd, 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 I'd line up in his team, really. But, but you know, when you're talking about a circle of fifths and a, a minor diminished seventh within an added bass C on. <laughs> D, you know, I kind of go, whoa, fuzzy, tumbleweed. But um, <laughs> but I suppose with you, knowing this, you have this bank of songs here and you're mm. improvising, you'd be able to go, okay, well, I know, I, I know that if I did this, I know that Herbie Hancock would then, he's he's played something like this in, in C and he's gone to a, a, an F sharp major with a with a, a G on the root or whatever. And you'd, you'd do that, you're improvising. But you're using you're using your toolkit, aren't you? So yeah, the, the, and you're all, using my ear to guide me through that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And every, yeah, and then I, what I, what what I try and do is um, I try and play. So if it's both sides now, for example, is play it, but then also improvise the harmony as I go along as well. So all right, so okay. that I'm not so I'm not you, just playing. You know what you're doing. You know what the harmony is. I know what the harmony is. So both sides now, you've probably played it. The harmony's, you know, it doesn't move around too much. Mm. But I might find myself playing, you know, things like D flat major seven and E flat major seven and those kind of things, which are not necessarily in the same changes that Joni would do, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Or it's, so it's jazzing. Just, it? Yeah, I suppose it is, yeah. I'm just trying to find my own sort of voice harmonically. So I quite like the challenge because by virtue of doing that, you know, it, can not always be good, I suppose, because you you might find yourself you you, you made the wrong choice, you know. But uh, mm. hence the album title of mine, choice. You know, <laughs> you make these decisions yeah. that you think, oh, I wish I'd done that, you know. But there you yeah. go. I think. But yeah. then sometimes on the other hand, you go, oh my gosh, I'm glad I did that. That was really nice. You know, that was a lovely moment. You're gonna make choices part two, which is called choices. Don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a friend said to me, "What are you gonna do with the other four hours?" I went, "Nothing. It's not. It's not. You know." That that's it. They, you know, I love that stuff. You know that that's the stuff I want it to be on the record. The other stuff, I'll just listen when I'm when I want. You know, but that's not what it's not going on the album. You know, no. But but you might think, hmm, hmm that's interesting. I, I yeah, might I mean, interpretation of that somewhere down the line. Absolutely, I think. Of, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember. To, I remember we sort of took it away and spent a few months, and I went to Andy's to mix it, and then I'd got an idea of the tracks, and then I like we played it through, and then Andy like. Ah, so that sounds. I think I can't remember exactly what Andy said, but one of the tracks he was like, "Oh, that sounds like old ground to me," and sort of thing. And I thought, "Oh yeah, he's right, yeah." And so okay. a little moment like that where somebody just gives you an opinion, you know, that's not yourself, and is like, "Oh yeah, yeah, you're right," and it actually makes such a difference to the order of the album. So grateful for Andy's sort of input on that. You know, it's really great. Well, that, again, that's about trusting ears, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. It was just like, yeah, I think it, you know that sounds like lightlessness. The one before that. You know, and I was like, yeah, it does, doesn't it, actually? Yeah, I need to let go of that thing, you know. So I, 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 I think, you know, the, you, you need you need uh, opposition sometimes. It's great friendship, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Shalaman, who did the um, Sixth Sense and a loads of films after it, mm. um, he he made the Sixth Sense and he, 
and um, he made an ending on it as well. He made he, he made a finishing piece, and the producer said, "We're not having that. Leave it as it is. You don't need that ending piece." And uh, he he said, "I was I was furious." And then he said, "I remember, I remember when I went to to the uh, the institute that, that taught him directorship and producing and all this and, and writing." Mm -hmm. I remember one of the guys said, be, be prepared to give up something you love. Hmm. That was my ending, and I absolutely loved it, and I had, to, I had to let it go. And then when the film came out, I went, oh, yeah, that's the proper ending. My ending would have been too descriptive, too obvious. It, now they're all right. leaving, going, hmm. Did he come back, or did he die, or did he see, it? or was it a dream? You know, let them do the work. When you, when you, art is is for me, it's inclusive. It gives them that. You know, I was mm. talking before about um, it, it's not my gig; it's it's their agenda. I'd um, I, I've taken a picture of because um, I do a bit of photography. And I, I take a picture of a street, um, interesting architecture, and a guy got in touch with me and said, "I used to live there." Uh, and it brought all the memories back for him. That wasn't my my picture. He owned that mm. picture. Now. In his head, that was that was him and his life and his memories. And so, um, you know, the, I, I think that's that that part of giving it away and let other people own it. You have to give them that space to do it. If you tell them, you know, this is a sculpture of Venus de Milo. It's got no arms because whatever. You know, and you tell them what it is. That's you, you've left them with no none of their own input and imagination. No, absolutely not. The kids, when they sing me the songs, you know, it's about this. I go, whoa, whoa, don't tell me. I don't want to know. Just sing me the song. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to know. You know, I really, I really, I just want to hear it. You know, yeah, no, I absolutely. In, um, so I'm looking here now. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at three albums here. Nick Drake. So what's your thoughts okay. on Nick Drake? Brighter, brighter Light and... Bright, yeah, Brighter Light, a Pink Moon and Five Leaves Left. And the one he made just acoustically and just left on the reception at, at, um, at, at Ireland. Pink, Pink Moon. Yeah. 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 I do struggle with his voice a little. Um, it's, it's, uh, he's an English guy and he's singing in English and, and that's absolutely fine. But it, it, it's a, oh, it's a bit, it's a bit flat and a bit folky for me. Oops. Is it? Uh, no, it's interesting. Yeah. Cause I, I really love Five Leaves Left. Yeah. Somebody Lyrically. Lyrically astonishing, absolutely. Astonishing. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll hold on to that. That's that sounds <laughs> that sounds good to me. What about classical music, Paul? Uh, oh, you see now why I have so many CDs is because um, although it's been uh, uh, put to bed now, addictive personality. Um, mm. So if there is a Miles Davis. I want all the Miles Davis. You know, me too. Will I? I do struggle with that. Mm. So, um, so I just have to slap the back of my hand and say, "Stop it! You don't need it. Just stream it or listen to it, but you don't have to own it." But um, so, so I, I know I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I, I love history, and so, and but I never ventured into the history of China because of where the hell do you start? And it's it's the same with classical music. Oh, oh my word! There's it, there's such a canon of work by each individual that um. It would be impossible for to go in there because I'd never come out. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I get it. My dad, my dad, he said Beethoven, all the odd numbers, listen to them. The even numbers, forget. You know, that was my classical training. Um, <laughs> but um, but then I heard uh, uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, um, you know, the uh, Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, things like that. Be, uh, just adorable. Um, and mm. so I know I know a bit of this and a bit of that. I know a bit of Rachmaninoff. I know a bit of uh, uh, um, Sibelia, whatever, you know, stuff. I, 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 yeah, you know, yeah. I, love, I love Chopin. There's things that, that I do. Um, I can't go near opera. That's just frightening. Yeah, that that's yeah. Didn't come to me till a while ago. Uh, it didn't come in early on, didn't that? <laughs> do, do, I mean, wow. I do, do, can, can you can you can you sit through? I have a sword. I have a sword. He has a sword. He has a sword. It's a very big sword. It's a very big sword. I have a sword. Just, yeah, you've got a sword, mate. <laughs> so I'm trying to think. What the last? I'm trying to think. What the last opera I went to it was a Britain opera, not that long ago. 
Uh, oh, the turn of the screw. Okay. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was astonishing. Yeah, I thought it was amazing. But I, it, it was something I didn't enjoy, and it was the last form of classical music that came to me that I appreciated, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I think if you went if you went to see Swan Lake, then, then it's jaw-dropping, you know. Um, yeah. Or I, I, I'm sure there's, there's, um, there's an easy way in, there's a pop way in to, uh, to operas, but you'd need a, a guide to gently uh, give you that as a, you know, um, and say, look, we'll ease you in here. We're going at the shallow end, and you can walk a bit further as you. I, I think what you just said is lovely, a way in. It's the, it's the same, isn't it? If it's poetry or whatever, you find a way in, and then, you, like you said about miles, you can trace it back and forward, but once you find your way in, that's a lovely way of looking at it, I think. Mm. Uh, okay, mm. Paul, what about uh, go Bob Dylan? Oof. <laughs> <You> start. <laughs> Uh, well, um, do you know I'm not that I'm not that knowledgeable on Bob Dylan. I can, um, I, I, you know, I love it, but I don't listen to it a lot. I must admit, mm. um, you know, I, I, I played "Don't Think Twice." It's all right, you know, yeah. play that because yeah. I really enjoy. It. I think it's just a cracking song. But apart from that, that's the only one I really touch. What about you? Are you a are you a are you a big fan? Of... Uh, I'm big, well, I'm a singer, and of course, I can't get. It's same with uh, Neil Young. I can't get past the voice. Um, very, very yeah. good. Um, and then a mate of mine, he just started. Um, he, he just started some poetry. He just started reading some poetry as we're sat there, and, he, uh, and I would say something, and he'd go, "Oh yeah, da 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 da, da tangled up in blue." And uh, I said, "That's really good. Who wrote that?" And he'd go, "Bob Dylan." And then you know he just kept doing it. He'd say, "Da da 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 da." I go, "Well, that's good. What's that?" Bob Dylan. And uh, so eventually, I, I, I got it and looked beyond the voice, which which I'm okay with now. And um, you think, oh my, that's good. And his radio shows have, have proven that um, this guy this guy knows his onions, um, yeah, um, yeah. and has continued to listen forever. Um, and that comes mm. out too. Uh, so I, I can re uh, I can I, relate to that like, in the mm. voice when it yeah. yeah. I can relate to that in the voice with, say, Tom York. Sometimes it's yeah. just... Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, I, beyond the voice, because sometimes the voice is uncomfortable for me of Tom York, so I've seen him, you know, seen him live and things. Um, sometimes it's just... But beyond that, it's just these amazingly beautiful compositions, but sometimes I come to visit them and I'm just like, I just can't bear that voice at the moment, you know. I don't know if it's just me, but... Uh, favourite favorite uh, Radiohead album? Uh, ooh. 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 Um, I would uh, okay computer. Okay, okay. Favorite one for you? Um, in rainbows. In rainbows. Oh, it's good though. In rainbows is beautiful. Yeah, that was what yeah. you pay what you want, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I paid nothing. No, um, uh, I still. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it is good. Uh, yeah, some beautiful songs on that, isn't there? A bit, does it end with videotape, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, I bought the box set. Um, I think it was the first nine albums the live album and all that stuff in it as well and uh yeah i i i do have like i don't have a tv so i don't i don't uh, a binge tv netflix thing i do that on music you know i have a david valley night and i do a or an xtc or um or yes again with john anderson you know sometimes you think oh, just a bit kind of stop it but but as yeah players, yeah see how um complete genius no, well, like, we're like you. We don't have a TV as well. We don't watch television, so it's quite interesting. People say, "What do you do?" Oh, uh, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Just yeah. don't watch the TV. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and again, this is we 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 mentioned it before, before we um, were chatting. The um, it's this the self isolation is if you don't have a TV, you're used to it. You're used to going. Okay, uh, how am I going to entertain myself? Well, you don't even have to think of it that because you've you're surrounded. Yeah. By and YouTube and uh, books and board games and whatever you know, we just absolutely we just know how to entertain ourselves. Absolutely, we're just rich in it. We're rich in it, and we enjoy it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been absolutely lovely to talk to you, Paul. Uh, I could probably talk to you all day about music. <laughs> well, we probably will. We probably will. we should well, do it again. I'm we've we've, <laughs> we've we've uh, we've scraped the surface. Well, we have, and um, I, I know a little you, bit. You, you wanted to talk to me, but uh, but but uh, but the other side of it is, um, I, I'd love to hear your side of the of what's going on, really. So we will we'll come back, and it'll be Muse asking the questions.